2006, six American zoos imported 33 wild-caught monkeys, which originated from the wilds of the Democratic Republic of Congo. They were part of a larger shipment, which had previously been exported from Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, to South Africa. In statements to the media at the time, zoo officials stated that the shipment had cost them approximately 400,000 US dollars, which they portrayed as a rescue mission undertaken in order to save the monkeys from being eaten as bushmeat or from being sold as pets. Our investigation, however, reveals a connection between well-known animal dealers in Africa involved in a flourishing trade in wildlife and one of the world's preeminent zoos, motivated to improve the breeding of captive animals with new additions from the wild. In so doing, the rules of CITES, the United Nations Convention which regulates the international trade in endangered species, are manipulated or disregarded, more often than not. This is the Kinshasa Connection. <laughs> Carla Mann is a Swiss photojournalist, author, and producer of investigative documentaries. He has lived in Africa for 30 years and has spent two decades documenting the escalating bushmeat crisis. Having learned that the San Diego Zoo claimed to have rescued orphaned monkeys found in bushmeat markets, he decided to look more closely into the real facts behind this primate shipment. His investigation started in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the country formerly known as Zaire, one rich in biodiversity but plagued by civil war. In 2008, a survey rated it second only to Somalia as the country with the worst quality of governance in Africa. For example, in 2002, both DRC's Minister of the Environment and Minister of Finance signed a new tax law which includes rates for the hunting of such highly endangered species as mountain gorillas and bonobos. And an official list of taxes for imports into the Central African Republic includes baskets of bushmeat and dead monkeys. An undercover investigator went to Kinshasa to speak with the two dealers involved in exporting the primates to South Africa. They were introduced by an official from the DRC CITES office. One of the dealers, Martin Bayard, assured that obtaining and exporting additional monkeys would not be a problem. He also stated that, due to the high price involved in the sale of the primates from South Africa to the United States, further demand as well as his prices would increase. You also sell uh, monkeys? Yeah, I have a monkey. Yeah. You also export before? Yeah, I put before I put the monkey to South Africa last, last year. What did you export? What? What monkey you export? I put the brother, wolf monkey, uh, red kilo, 100,000 kilo dollar. For 33 months, 100,000. It's over money. Yeah, it's over They write on the paper, newspaper, that monkey make noise everywhere because that's what meant to ship. Send that money to, to America for 400,000. Mr. Bayard also operates a residence in Johannesburg from which he imports and sells African grey parrots from the DRC. His wife, in his absence, offered more primates for sale from the Congo. Alex Bajangi is the other Kinshasa-based animal dealer, whose business card reflects his established international status, listing addresses in Johannesburg, as well as in Congo, Brazzaville. My customers from South Africa sell that monkey to USA. So, 
Bahamas? Well, I'll get down there. But then, <coughs> Black Mark gave me a turn for something like that. Black Mark. Okay. Uh, never asked the Mark. I said for 3,000 years ago. My flag. Okay. And from South Africa, we will deny the uh, flag the bias from DSA. Only 10, not all stock. I send, I send about 60. Okay? And it sells only 10. 400 stock. From his home in Kenya, Carl called Mr. Bajangi to request an official interview but did not receive a very favorable I response. I, got it. I have everything in my office. What about the capture permits and the permit origin? Everything I got. Oh, don't, don't get out of trouble. Please. I write the, the, the paper to Koitaki and then Koitaki sent the, the, the paper to uh, Mazen Bashir. Mashir, give me the, uh, give me the answer. They reply me to, to export that money. CITES regulations stipulate that before listed species can be traded across international borders, all national laws must be adhered to, and both in-country heads of the CITES scientific and management authorities must approve the transaction, based upon non-detriment findings, having established that the wild populations will not be adversely affected. In 2007, Carl travelled to Kinshasa for the purpose of interviewing some of the Congolese officials involved in authorising and approving the necessary export permits. He first called on Pasteur Cosma, the director of the ICCN, the institute in charge of wildlife and protected areas within the DRC. Mr Cosma denounced the export of the primates to South Africa and the United States he further stated that while the DRC would consider scientific exchanges of a small number of animals, he denounced the commercial export of any wildlife and stated that his office had cancelled pending contracts. C'est là où la situation avait été posée, qu'il y a eu des primates qui ont été retrouvés effectivement dans des eaux aux États-Unis, des singes. Les chiffres étaient diversement avancés à plusieurs ceux qui ont parlé de 30, ceux qui ont parlé même de 300, ceux qui ont parlé ainsi de suite. Alors ma position était que je n'étais pas effectivement d'accord que des singes ou des primates puissent partir sans que nous soyons au courant, sans que nous soyons totalement informés. At the CITES offices, Carl then met with Mr. Kanu, the new director of wildlife. He stated that because he was not in office at the time of the export in question, he would not be willing to address Carl's questions relating to it. Instead, he explained the role of the CITES scientific and management authorities and how the two should check and balance each other. Mr. Ngoitaki is the former head of the CITES Management Authority and the Director of Wildlife for Congo. Uh, he states early on in our uh, meeting that he is no longer in charge of these authorities and as such is not willing to go on record. However, later on he relents and pulls out some files and we are able to discuss some specifics as far as this earlier export is concerned. In the following statement he tells us again how he wrote to the scientific authority uh, and received approval for the go-ahead of this export. He then says that he sent his people to inspect the facilities at the two animal dealers to establish what primates they were holding. With that statement, he makes it clear that there were no, no capture permits, that there were no permis de détention légal, or his office would have known what primates were being held at the facilities of these two dealers. Qui voudrait exporter les serpopithèques. Alors je, je consulte mon checklist parce que mes gens sont allés, les gens que 
sortent là, ils sont allés chez M. Pierre, ils ont identifié les différents singes. C'est des cercopithèques en général. The national laws of the Congo also state that no firearms are allowed to be used in any kind of official trapping or capture operation. In the case of this export, they were all small babies. Clearly the mothers didn't shove their small children into the traps of animal capturers and trappers, and as such they would have shot the mothers out of the trees and collected the babies that way, illegal under Congo law, and as such no export should have taken place on the site, these rules and regulations. Vous n'êtes pas permis d'utiliser le fusil. Ah, ils sont tous des petits singes comme ça. Ils sont de la, de la, la mère doit être tuée pour obtenir les bébés. Non, 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 pas nécessairement. Il y en a beaucoup dans notre pays. Si vous allez à l'Équateur, vous allez à Kisangani. On les mange d'ailleurs. I then ask him about the 2002 tax law, which was signed by two ministers at the time. And I pointed out that since Congo had exported ten thousands of parrots, uh, about five to ten thousand a year, and that law stipulated an export tax of some sixty dollars per bird. And as such, I asked where did this up to six hundred thousand dollars annually end up, uh, which should have been collected for the export of these birds. He tells me that this law was never applied because the dealers complained that the cost, the export permit cost, was too high, and as such, it was ignored. He then produces a file and pulls out the document which he states is the non-detriment finding which was issued at the time by Madame Bashige, something she will later on deny. And uh, looking at the document, we realize that it is for 34 primates, despite the fact that over 100 were in the end exported. When I point that out to him, he immediately closes the file and tells me, I don't know. <laughs> Scientifique, c'est ce que j'aime des scientifiques, c'est des SRDC. Avis scientifique, relatif à l'exportation des 34 singes. Ok, mais on a Vous exporté 103 singes. Non, ça, ça, moi, moi, moi je ne sais pas. Moi je ne sais pas. Voilà, alors, alors là, ça, ça commence. S'il vous plaît. Alors, c'est ça le problème. The interview concluded with Mr. Ngoi Taki repeating that it was unnecessary to censor primates in the DRC, where they existed in such numbers that neither hunting nor exporting would affect the general populations. A strange statement by DRC's former director of wildlife, who should be aware that in the last decade, the Congo's elephant population has declined from an estimated 90,000 to 9,000. The eastern lowland gorilla from 15,000 to just 5,000. The northern white rhino from 30 to zero. And the hippo population of Virunga National Park from 30,000 to only a few hundred. There can be little doubt that, if ever conducted, scientific censuses of the lesser primates would reveal similar declines in populations. We then managed to track down Madame Bashige, who was, at the time of the export, the head of ICCN and the head of the Congo Scientific Authority. She contradicts the earlier statement by Mr. Ngoitaki and says she never issued a non-detriment finding and she would not have done so for the commercial export of a large number of primates. Que l'autorité scientifique de l'ICCN pouvait permettre la sortie d'autant de singes. Ça, je ne pense pas. Of the scientific authority, she stated that the minister at the time regularly gave the go ahead without consulting her and her authority. That minister is also known to have had close personal relationships with both the animal dealers we interviewed earlier. That minister is also known to have had close personal relationships with both the animal dealers we interviewed earlier. But I know that many times we have 
que le ministère de l'Environnement donnait des autorisations euh, et faisait des permis CITES sans avoir l'autorisation de l'autorité scientifique. She goes on and explains that she had several meetings with this and prior ministers to point out that the basis for scientific non-detriment findings were just not there. There was no census data and as such there should be no commercial exports of any wildlife from the Congo. C'est un grand problème et je me souviens que quand j'étais l'autorité de l'ICCN, c'est une discussion que j'avais souvent avec les ministres pour lui dire que L'autorité scientifique, finalement, elle donne des autorisations sur euh, des choses qu'elle ne comprend pas, qu'elle ne maîtrise pas, parce que les inventaires n'ont pas été faits depuis de nombreuses années. These are the over 20 criteria which should be taken into consideration by any scientific authority in determining the non-detriment finding. In the case of the Congo, as we heard from Mr. Ngaitaki, the criteria is our forests are full of thousands of these monkeys. We eat them by the thousands, so there cannot possibly be a problem with capturing some and exporting some. She concludes the interview by again stating that at the time of the export, there was no basis for issuing any non-detriment finding, that the scientific data, the census data was not available, and as such, she considers any permits issued at the time as having been false. But moi, je les appelle des faux parce que ils se sont pas basés sur la loi réglementaire, c'est-à-dire l'autorité scientifique. From DRC, our investigation moved to South Africa. There, Carl managed to interview one of the two animal dealers who initially imported the primates. He claimed to have since left the animal trading business, and although he denied any wrongdoing asked that his identity not be revealed. Yeah, are you available now for a few questions? Yeah, I used to um, import African grass in the DRC. And on one occasion we were in the DRC and we happened to go to the market um, just to have a look around and we saw a monkey in a cage and I asked about this monkey and they told me it's there for the pet trade. And um, I felt very sorry for this monkey and um, uh, I understood that if it wasn't purchased by someone, it would become dinner and that upset me terribly. So I decided to purchase the monkey, give it to one of my African grey suppliers to keep in the DRC. At least it would be safe. And then we started to find out um, whether um, these primates were, what CITES they were, were there CITES 1, CITES 2, what they were, and we found out that there were CITES 2. And um, there was a lot of these primates in Kinshasa itself, a lot of them. And um, the ones that were in Kinshasa itself, I asked my supplier if he could raise CITES permits for them so I could import them. References to CITES 1 or 2 pertain to species listed in CITES appendices. Appendix 1 species are those considered so endangered that they cannot be traded across international borders, alive or dead. Appendix 2 species, however, are considered merely threatened and can be traded commercially. Carl then asked him to comment on some photographs he had taken of the monkeys when they were first found in Kinshasa. Rather than depicting a bushmeat market setting, as he and the American zoos had claimed, the images had clearly been taken on the premises of a wildlife trader. The question is, how did these primates first arrive in Kinshasa? Were they byproducts of the bushmeat trade? Or had they been illegally procured in the interior of the country by hunters specifically targeting mothers for the purpose of taking the young? While he could offer no conclusive answer, the dealer felt that the rules of the rest of the world should not be applied to the DRC. I mean, you know, it's a completely different world there. Um, it's not, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, I'm just saying it's a different world to what we are used to. Yeah, okay, but I mean, we're talking about a different world over there, but uh, the CITES convention covers all the different worlds, Correct. including Kinshasa. Correct. When questioned about the legality of the importation into South Africa, he further defends his involvement. As far as we are concerned, 
uh, we go according to the South African law, and the South African law is that we are allowed to import CITES 2 as long as they're bona fide CITES 2 permits. And we followed as far as the Congo is concerned about how they are allowed to keep the animals, if they're allowed to keep the animals, what permits they need. Obviously, I never got involved in that. I didn't even ask those questions. The next step was to question the South African CITES authorities regarding some of the particulars of the primate importation. In Pretoria, Carl interviewed CITES official Miss Sonia Meintes. He asked her about the discrepancy between the number of CITES export permits issued by DRC and the number of CITES import permits issued by South Africa. It had been noted that the number of monkeys of a particular species which entered South Africa as specified on the import permit, was more than the number of animals of the same species as declared on the export permit. She said she would check the original permits and then contact us in writing. We'll do that in writing. However, all further attempts to elicit a response from anyone in this regard have been unsuccessful. Next, we visited Mr. Mike Bester, a prominent South African dealer as well as a zoo owner who handled the final negotiations and sale of the 33 monkeys and ultimately their exportation to America. His repeated references to we suggested that he was also involved in their initial importation from DRC. Are you interested in primates? Yes. I have... You can you mill you... Uh, uh, I have the biggest yeah. shipment of primates that come out of the Congo that has ever come out of the Congo. But you're a Jew and broker at the same time? Correct. Correct. This is the primates. What a good quality, eh? Yeah. Very tight spot now. Also salt already? Yeah. The ones I'm showing you now are going to, uh, to, to San Diego Zoo in America. These are sold, but I have some that aren't sold. Yeah. Because it's all new bloodlines. It's all out of the wild. Everyone. Everyone is out the wild from the bushmeat markets. We had to build a quarantine station in the Congo, and that's not easy. We had to get the land, we had to get all the materials, had to build a quarantine station. He later gave an official interview and stated that he had never traveled to the Congo. Carl asked him about the still photos, which, we had been told, were taken at the time that the monkeys were first discovered in Kinshasa, and yet did not appear to depict a bushmeat market setting, as had been claimed. But then there must be trade in the live ones as well, I guess. He also confirmed the identities of the two Congolese dealers and their relationship. Well, Alex and Martin, Alex and Martin have been partners for for many, many years. They cooperate with each other. Okay. I think the one is out of Bushimaya and one is out of Kinshasa, as I as yeah, I recall. I bought parrots from them for the last fifteen years or twelve years or whatever. So uh, I know that they cooperate on some stuff, but they don't. They fierce competitors on other stuff. He then clarified the criteria by which the American zoos had selected the particular species they ordered and chose to import. Yes, because, because to me what was interesting is if, I mean, I've got uh, uh, Karen's correspondence here, was species that they did not have a sufficient gene pool in the States, they didn't take. Although they said they would love to have them because they don't, they decided that it was, it was absolutely pointless to take two or three of a species because uh, they had no genetic up uh, in the USA, they only took ones where there were fairly genetically stable groups in the States as new bloodlines. And that was clearly explained right from the beginning. I can show you correspondence on that as well. The species, the other species they didn't touch. The importation of wild caught animals by zoos is considered necessary for improving the genetic diversity of captive populations. The San Diego Zoo's associate curator, Miss Karen Kilmer, was quoted in the press as stating, these were species we worked with. Certainly some new animals would keep our populations healthy. One of the species imported by the San Diego Zoo was Allen's swamp monkey. Indeed, evidence indicates that, at the time, the captive population in American zoos consisted of 33 animals. And the American Zoological Association's target for a healthy captive population was 75. A few years ago, did elephants to the states for exactly that reason? Is that the, your genetic pool become, and you get overrepresented individuals and they run out of genetic material? This last statement may refer to the fact that in 2003, 
the San Diego Zoo imported five adolescent wild-caught elephants from Swaziland. Although several South African reserves offered to relocate them to wild areas where they could have roamed freely, the zoo's more lucrative financial offer bought them a lifetime in captivity. The 33 monkeys which ultimately reached the American zoos were transported from South Africa to San Francisco by KLM Airlines. This would seem to contradict their policy as specified in the Manual of the International Air Transport Association, which for KLM states that wild court animals will not be accepted for carriage. We did ask KLM for an interview, they declined and responded in writing instead, stating that while they had a policy of not uh, exporting wild cold wildlife, they would make exception if the transaction was between zoos and zoos. In the context of South Africa, this throws up a different question. In the case of Mr. Bester, he's not only the owner of a zoo, but also a well-known animal dealer, and as such, a zoo to zoo export means animal dealer to zoo export as well. The headquarters of the United Nations CITES Secretariat is in Geneva, Switzerland. This biodiversity convention proposes to control the trade in wildlife and wildlife products across international borders. In Geneva, Carl interviewed Mr. John Seller, the sole enforcement officer charged with monitoring a convention to which 175 nations are signatories. And to begin with, these are Appendix 2 species. So, you know, CITES does not regard them as endangered, but we regard them as being of conservation concern. So before an Appendix 2 species can be traded, uh, the management authority, the National CITES Management Authority, must uh, make two uh, findings. One is that the animals were obtained uh, other than in contravention of the law. And then the second is that if they explore these animals, it would have a detrimental impact on the remaining species, wild populations of the species. It's, in my opinion, totally impossible they could have been collected legally. If the Congo then says they were collected legally, can, is there no way to get to the bottom of it and say, show us any of this certification? This is the law of the land. Again, that, that is a matter for them to determine. Yeah. Okay, but I mean, made, can you made... go back and ask for these specifics that you have informed me that it was legal? The question is, can you supply for these 17 permits? They but, say but, so. but, no, but hang on. Why should we? Because here the law says one thing, and you know it's impossible to no, reconcile no, that I've, with, I've, with the other. Facts. We we have two clear statements from a government agency that this complied with the convention. Why should we call these people liars? Because the evidence shows that somebody is not telling the truth. It's I or me who is not telling the truth or them. Well, but you know, as I say, at the moment, you know, we have really very little grounds to go back. Now, as United Nations officials, we you know, need much clearer evidence to go back and say to a, a government, you're liars, we don't believe you. They'll be doing a film, they're public servants, they're, they're you know, justifying this trade. Well, uh, but you know, did, did, why do they have to justify the trade? This is, it's like, you know, you're putting a, <laughs> you can go and put them in that position, but, uh, you know, as international civil servants, without very good reason, we can't. Why should we put them in that position? Mr. Seller repeatedly emphasized that the primates in question were Appendix 2 listed animals and therefore not considered endangered. However, several of the species are included in the World Conservation Union's Red List of Threatened Species, which indicates that their status in the wild is insufficiently known. And in August of 2008, the International Primate Symposium announced that, in fact, fully one half of the world's primates now face extinction. Uh, okay, then the next aspect, legally or not legally collected, is of course the non-detriment finding as part as being the, the offtake being sustainable. Has the CITES, IUCN, anybody got any idea of how many of these primates exist in the Congo today? Are there any figures out there? I can't find any. Well. Uh, unfortunately, you're asking the wrong person, because as you know, I'm an enforcement yeah. officer of the convention, so I, I don't, I'm not a population expert. Um, my, I know when this um, trade first came to our notice, uh, I discussed it generally with our 
with my scientific colleagues here and they indicated to me that uh, these are species that, that are appendix to for a good reason. However, as the IUCN projections indicate, because census data for most primate species is grossly deficient, the conservation status of wild populations is largely unknown. Prudence would seem to dictate that, until accurate data is collected and made available, further exportations of wildlife from such poorly governed countries as the DRC should be curtailed or at least closely scrutinized. In America, U.S. authorities have expressed grave concern regarding the magnitude and growth of the illegal black market in wildlife, purportedly the world's third largest illegal trade after drugs and arms. And in 2007, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that they will no longer accept CITES quotas without first making their own separate biological and management non-detriment determinations. In California, the San Diego Zoo announced the arrival of the monkeys in the spring of 2006. Our requests for an interview, however, were denied. We are outside the San Diego Zoo here. We have offered the management on several occasions the right to respond to allegations that they are more interested in making money and getting people through these gates than they are in animal welfare and conservation issues. They have consistently rejected our requests. In numerous statements to the press, the zoo portrayed the primate importation as an isolated rescue mission for the purpose of saving bushmeat orphans from the pet trade. As we have seen, however, our evidence indicates that the monkeys were found in appalling conditions on the premises of Congolese animal dealers, who had likely ordered them from hunters, using firearms to kill the mothers, in violation of numerous national laws of the DRC, as well as international CITES regulations. Karen Kilmar, the San Diego Zoo's associate curator of mammals, was quoted as stating that the animals would otherwise have been sold into the hobbyist trade as pets, a claim we heard contradicted by the South African dealer who imported them. We were allowed to um, only sell them to zoos and to primate breeders, registered primate breeders. We weren't allowed to sell them as pets. At no stage whatsoever were they allowed to be sold at pets, as pets. Jane Ballantyne, a spokeswoman for the AZA, was quoted as saying that the primate shipment was a one-time thing only. It would seem, however, that the San Diego Zoo has a history of doing business with South African dealers, through whom they acquired elephants from Swaziland in 2003, and more recently, we've heard, wild-caught hyenas from Tanzania. In media statements, no secret was made of the fact that the total cost of importing the 33 monkeys was approximately 400,000 US dollars. Jim Maddy, the American Zoo Association's executive director, was quoted as stating that the monkeys would bring the harrowing story of the bushmeat trade to the visiting public. However, $400,000 in the name of wildlife conservation might have been better spent at the Kinshasa Zoo to educate the Congolese public about the bushmeat trade, where the problem is more dire and acute than in America, and to improve the facilities and the lives of those animals unfortunate enough to be exhibited there. CITES is a biodiversity convention which many consider a highly effective watchdog for policing crimes against wildlife and the environment. However, with only one enforcement officer assigned the task of monitoring the actions of 175 countries, CITES is largely dependent upon individual member nations policing their own performance. When applied to countries like the DRC, that is rather like asking the foxes to guard the hen house. As long as there is financial incentive, there appears to be no shortage of individuals willing and able to do anything necessary to line their pockets at the expense of the world's dwindling wildlife. 
To this end, CITES does not appear to present a significant deterrent. While zoos have an increasingly crucial role to play in wildlife conservation, so too can their need to lure visitors and maintain genetically viable populations do much to perpetuate the illegal wildlife trade and undermine the very ideals which they avow. Primates are our closest animal relatives, and yet they continue to be exploited, hunted, eaten, and traded for profit. If we cannot do more to safeguard their natural existence, how can we ensure our own?